admire. It kind of took me by surprise because it wasn't that I was unaware that David Cassidy existed, but he was definitely passing me by. And certainly as a young teen living in England back then, you know, it wasn't the, the done thing that, you know, a, a young teenage boy would get drawn to someone like David Cassidy. But I did. And uh, it came as a bit of a surprise to me at the time, I remember. But once I was hooked, I was hooked and suddenly became really present to this magnificent talent, his voice, the impact that his music suddenly started having on me. And I think, you know, I think it's the benefit of hindsight that allows me to say this now. I don't think I realised this then, but I was, as you said in the intro, on the cusp of being a teenager and clearly looking for a role model. And what David Cassidy represented to me was an incredibly successful artist. Uh, he kind of looked like, um, at least in terms of what was portrayed in the media, you know, and how we interpret things through the media. To me, I, what he represented was someone I'd like to be, someone I could have as a role model. I didn't think of it as lucidly as that as a young teenager then, but, but certainly that's what he was. And it, it just became a, a, a haven for me. And I think, you know, I've, I've been reflecting, you know, what was I going to share with you as we came to this podcast? You know, one of the mantras of my life is don't tell me that I can't, right? If you tell me that I can't, I'll show you that I can. And I think there might have been an element of that in choosing David Cassidy as opposed to any other artist. But nevertheless, at the time, whilst I really greatly admired his talent, I had no sense that in, in the years to come, it would be something that would continue to impact my life, to inspire me, to uh, bring me hope, to bring me solace when I felt sad, um, to be, you know, just a, a place of um, quiet reflection and, and all of that. I just really um, was taken by the impact that he had on me. You mentioned there about his, the Im impact of his music. Was it really his solo work that introduced you to him as opposed to the music of the Partridge family? Certainly. I mean, again, you know, when I think back, yes, of course, I was aware the Part of the Partridge family. I'd probably seen a couple of episodes here and there. It was at the time that I saw those episodes, it was kind of interesting TV, but nothing impactful. So it was definitely David Cassidy's solo work that reached out to me and right collection of songs, right time in an impressionable young boy's life, that, that collection of songs on the Dreams of Nothing More Than Wishes album said something to me that I needed to hear, I guess. And I, um, you know, there are obviously in the Partridge Family catalogue of songs, a number of songs that I, I really love you know, like most fans do. But even to this day, I, I tend not to listen to Partridge Family albums so much. I'll choose the songs that I like rather than the albums. Whereas David's body of work, I have listened backwards and forwards and every possible combination of which, like just over and over and over and over and over again over the years. So th to whatever extent it was true in the early recordings and hopefully more so in the later recordings, for me, when he was being David Cassidy and singing David Cassidy, then there was an element of authenticity in there. And maybe he yearned for more. And maybe he got closer to his authentic self as the years went on. But certainly, you know, if you go right back for me, right back to the very first album, Cherish, which I then discovered retrospectively, it's a great body of songs. And, you know, some people even describe Cherish as a, a quasi Partridge family album, but I, I don't agree. I think it's it's... It's much more than that. Um, and, you know, like one of the earliest recordings there on that very album is, you know, the song I Am A Clown. Incredibly deep and impactful and theatrical and emotional recording for an artist. And, and I recall as a young lad, that was one song that just spoke to me. I think it said something for me. It helped me understand what I was potentially struggling with and trying to find my place like all teenagers do in the world. Um, yeah, so right from the get-go, it was there. And it was David. It was David, for sure. He clearly helped you to redefine yourself as a teenager. Oh, for find sure. Find your identity. Yes. Can you recall any moment he really arrived on your radar? I think, you know, I, like I'm able to explicitly say... October 1973. I was almost 13. I turned 13 in December. October 1973 was when there was the big 
Daydream, a puppy song, had been a massive hit. Then that out came the album. That also went to number one. And suddenly he just landed as a presence in my life. My pathway to, to David actually was through my best mate at high school, who interestingly was also a major David Cassidy fan and a guy like me. And it wasn't the done thing to be a guy and a David Cassidy fan, which I'll just divert for a second. I have a theory around that. I, my theory in retrospect is that David Cassidy had such an impact on the girls of the United Kingdom, which was my frame of reference back then, that left guys nowhere to go. You know, the girls that they were interested in were interested in David Cassidy. And, you know, and if you didn't look a bit like David, then they probably weren't going to be interested in you. So I think it was like a counter backlash. I could be wrong, but that's my theory. Anyway, I remember Robert Futcher was his name, and we're still friends to this day. Bob and I uh, became friends when I joined high school, and, and then I discovered he liked David Cassidy, and it was like, really? Okay, fine. So I already knew that he was a fan, and I, I don't know to what extent that influenced me, but then this, this body of work arrived, and all of a sudden, I just went from, oh, David Cassidy is someone that Bob likes, to, hang on a second, wow, like this is really really incredible and I listened to the songs and then I just became intensely interested not only in the songs but in him as an artist you know who was he what did he represent to me and what he represented to me was you know he was a popular figure he was clearly good looking he clearly at least in terms of a media presence and how he is portrayed would have no issues in having friends and attracting girls and being the popular guy and you know and that was everything I wanted to be. And who, want, who would want to be a kind of a kind of a rock star, cool guy, friends galore, girls galore? Like it just that aspect of who he was just imprinted on me. Um, but it was accompanied by the music. And when I would listen to the music, and like any dramatic young teenager, I would listen to music in the dark and you know see the funny little clown and all that kind of stuff. Or can't go home again or sing me or you know it was just my heart it just it was singing my heart and I I wanted to have what he had I wanted to experience what he said to me through his music um and 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 it was from then on really um, any particular yeah. songs within the the dreams album that were significant for you um can't Go Home again became a significance. I loved that song from the get-go, but it became really significant for me when we came to Australia because I did not want to come here. Did not want to come here. Um, so that that was a very deep and personal song for me. Um, Sing Me, this, the autobiographical song that Tony Ramirez wrote for David to record on that album, I thought was a really beautiful song. Uh, of course, you know, there's the heart-rendering, um, you know, Daydreamer. Look, I, I, if I keep going, I'll probably mention every song on the album, but I think they're probably the, the three standout ones, most especially. For me, you know, one of the accusations thrown at David at that time and around his career around that time was, you know, like he was just a dismissible artist. He was a, a bubblegum artist. And yet those songs, that music, the way they were recorded and put together and the way that he performed them, were sophisticated. And I think actually, even to this day, you know, like I have maturity now, I have insight now. And, and to me, they still stand the test of time as a, as a, you know, discrete body of work that is as credible as anything that was regarded as credible at that time. But they're, they're, they're probably the three main songs. Do I you hear. consider him underappreciated as an artist? Yeah, I do. I do. I don't get... You know, there, there are a number of artists who've been down this pathway where they, they start out and, they, and their impact is clearly with teenagers and in particular girls. You know, you could look at the Beatles and Elvis before David and say the same, that, that you know, in their early concerts, especially when you look at photographs and see video footage of those concerts, it's predominantly screaming girls. And so there was that, that dynamic, that relationship going on for them, but they were able to transcend it. And, and I think the argument that people would like to run as to why they were able to transcend it is because they were talented. And, and therefore, by implication, somehow David Cassidy wasn't talented enough, which I personally completely refute. I, I don't know what it was about David's experience that made it different to the, ex 